Hello and welcome to uh, what I'm really looking forward to as possibly the highlight of my last two weeks. Uh, I'm joining you live from Bonn at the SB42 negotiations where uh, negotiators have been uh, taking a fair amount of time to get through uh, what they call mechanical streamlining. Um, so I thought it's the best time to take a step away from, uh, from that type of slowness and to kind of jump back in with, uh, with one of my kind of all-time heroes from the UNFCCC and, uh, and get a bit of a global perspective from someone who's now trying to take his experience within these negotiations and, and put it on the global scale. So I uh, am really proud to uh, introduce to you all uh, Yeb Sano, who is uh, joining us for this uh, webinar today. Yeb, why don't you say hello? Hello, hello. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. And hello to everyone in this conversation. And uh, it's a uh, great uh, joining you. I, uh, well, while Chris is in Bonn, I am here in his hometown in Sydney, in Australia, as part of a uh, special journey. So this is one of the stopovers. I had a fantastic time here, connecting uh, with people and uh, in, in, in uh, in, uh, in my brief stay here. Um, yeah, and, and, and how uh, is Sydney treating you? You've never, I guess, uh, Australia hasn't always been your uh, your biggest, uh, or I guess one of your more favorite countries in the negotiations over the years. Sorry, Chris, you were, you were, uh, uh, you were, Waking up there, can, can you say that again? Uh, how is Sydney treating you? Uh, the Australian negotiators weren't exactly your closest friends during the, your time at the UNFCCC, but is uh, is the general country treating you okay nowadays? Well, yeah, and I, I, I did get to uh, visit uh, uh, what you, uh, you locally refer to as a real country here. I'm getting some... Um, a lot of uh, a fantastic time uh, in the Blue Mountains today, and uh, amazing people I've met here. It's, uh, it's been fantastic. Chris. Yeah, and and what are you kind of doing in the Blue Mountains? What are you hoping to do over the next couple of weeks there? The next couple of weeks, I am, uh, I am. Uh, oh, right now I'm in Australia. Uh, in Sydney in, in specifically, and then in the next couple of days, I'll be spending some time here to Harbour Bridge, across the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And the day after that, I proceed to uh, the Great Barrier Reef, um, which will also highlight uh, the significance of the Great Barrier Reef uh, in the context of climate change and um, what needs to be done to protect and save uh, the, the reef. Um, after that, uh, we uh, would be standing by, uh, I'll, I'll most likely be at route to Rome for uh, the release of the Pope's encyclical on the environment, something we anticipate very much uh, as it uh, is hopefully going to resonate what uh, many of us send across um, and uh, um, yeah, as a message to world leaders. Um, to take climate change, especially as we try to forge that uh, every important agreement uh, this year. So uh, that, that's what's uh, going to be taking up my time for the next couple of weeks, Chris. Wow, it sounds like you're going to be uh, even more busy than you would have been this time last year. Yes, wonderfully busy. and. Uh, but uh, I think the big difference is that uh, it's easier to connect with people on the ground, and um, I'll be doing a lot of that. All right. Well, well, I wonder if we can maybe kind of explore some of your time while you were in the UNFCCC, and then we'll kind of move our way back to your time now and, and the way you, you now see with your new kind of vision of moving forward in the, in the broader climate movement. Um, so. I actually was uh, first surprised when I learned that you didn't originally come into kind of, I guess, the UNFCCC through diplomatic circles. Uh, you were originally uh, a, an NGO just like us, is that right? 
That's true. I have been working with civil society for at least 14 years before um, I was invited to join the Philippine government as a commissioner for climate change. Um, and uh, you're right, I've been working on the ground uh, in, uh, in the context of uh, NGO work before I joined the government and eventually becoming the chief negotiator for the Philippines. Yeah, and, and I guess then that's when all the fireworks started uh, going off. So when you first made that transition from, from, I guess, the NGO scene to being a negotiator, what was the biggest difference you noticed about your work? Um, well, it was a more world for me. I, um, I was, of course, uh, wearing an official hat, uh, sitting there, uh, representing the, the Philippines and my own country as a, as a negotiator, but also being able to reach out to, to friends in civil society and um, and, uh, and work together to understand the problem of climate change and what we need to do in the international negotiations. Uh, it's been a very, very fulfilling time for me then. And, but uh, talking about the big difference, I had to wear suits and uh, I had to buy a, a full wardrobe when I joined. Uh, government and had to be a negotiator um, uh, and uh, um, it was uh, in, in, a, in a way um, quite uh, natural for someone um, to be so passionate about uh, about this issue and be a negotiator for a country that is uh, uh, naturally also has a moral on the moral high ground regarding this issue. The Philippines is one of the most vulnerable countries, and um, it had uh, very little historical contribution to climate change. And uh, as such, uh, we were negotiating from the point of the vulnerable point of view of uh, uh, um, uh, from from the from a position of weakness, if, if you want to call it that. But then we we were really punching above our weight and. Uh, very proud of that. Yeah, and I guess um, that, I guess, moral high ground was really, really important for you. And, and especially as, as we w went into kind of 2012, 2013, uh, that's when kind of uh, you started really shining, I guess, as a negotiator and, and, and started taking like a very kind of uh, public um, role and, and kind of very much a proactive role within the negotiations. What was the big shift that happened around that time that kind of led you down that path? Um, I, I believe in providence, and uh, it, 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 was not, uh, it was nothing that I never imagined, and uh, obviously nothing you cannot plan for, but you can plan for. Um, it's uh, something that happens because of circumstance as well. Um, it was uh, something... Yeah, I've been doing so since 2010. I've been uh, taking care of uh, the negotiations for the Philippines, and um, um, it, it was uh, a confluence of events uh, in 2013. It was uh, a climate impact act happening in the Philippines, uh, even even the year before, and um, we were uh, a lot of uh, crystallization of. Uh, uh, the processes in the negotiation valley action plan had been, in a way, abandoned, and uh, a new phase had begun towards building this agreement towards Paris. Um, um, but, but to my mind, it was, uh, was uh, merely a postponement of Copenhagen, a uh, six year postponement. Um, uh, and for the confluence event, of events uh, that uh, um, combined to, um, to that combined in a powerful way and uh, I, being at the right place uh, at the right time or probably you, you can also look at it uh, in the wrong place at the, at the, at the wrong time but um, I had there and uh, negotiate for your country you, you always have uh, to, to, to choose from, um, and one of those choices is to uh, just uh, stay quiet, stay silent, shut up your mouth. Another choice is to 
um, yeah, plug in a machine, uh, do what you're expected to do. And the, the other choice you have is um, to send, uh, and deliver what needs to be delivered in the context uh, of uh, the voices of so many people who cannot articulate their own voice. So I choose the third, uh, I choose the third one, and, um, and uh, a lot of things happen after that. Hmm. And, and I guess that's when uh, a lot of things started changing personally and, and within the negotiations as well. I wonder if, uh, if we can kind of dig into some of these, uh, some of what I would like to call, you know, the personal relationships that you developed during the, re the negotiations. Um, because obviously you started negotiating in a way that was, uh, was very prominent and was very public. And, and I'm guessing you would have created a few rivalries among other negotiators. What was, your, uh, what was your best rivalry? What was the most fun to kind of get out there and argue for you? Um, Chris, do you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, rivalry, I don't know what rivalry you're talking about, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a healthy, it's a healthy relationship out there with many negotiators. Um, you have 195 countries uh, trying to eke out a, a, a deal out there. Um, you just uh, have some people putting their best foot forward. You have some people who probably would be discontent on um, watching the whole the whole thing um, unfold before the eyes. Uh, you have you have the initial suspects, probably those who. Uh, go out there and uh, say what they're told to say um, uh, um, in, 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 in very square in a very square way, um, uh, and, and there, there are those who um, also try to facilitate the whole process by being a very effective, uh, very effective um, bridges, uh, if you may across, across uh, negotiating blocks, across the parties. Sure. Uh, but I, I don't think there's a, there's a, what you can call a rivalry. Um, I, I never felt it that way. Well, I guess on the reverse then, did you have any kind of uh, very strong friendships with people that perhaps you, you were kind of negotiating against because of kind of political differences? Uh -huh. So, um, I, I dealt a lot with uh, climate finance uh, in my last negotiations uh, and the finance tensions area. Hmm. Um, I work with the missing people there, both from developing and developed countries. I think they're all uh, doing what they earn as the profit forward. Um, yes, I've, uh, I've developed a lot of good friendships with uh, many of them. Um, both, uh, especially EU negotiators, um, some come from the U.S. Uh, uh, and also uh, as a, some from from your good old Australia, uh, Chris. It's, uh, it's been a it's been a fantastic uh, journey as well, meeting all of them and uh, trying to uh, trying to express uh, own different views about about uh, the whole EU. But uh, I have my favorites too, and uh, yeah, uh, our Australian friends are among them. Ah, wow. <laughs> well, that's certainly not expected, um, but uh, but great to hear. And, and I guess like one of the other funny things about the climate negotiations, and if you're watching live now, uh, you might not have uh, ever been to a climate negotiation, and you might want to know exactly what we're talking about. Um, and if you do have any questions, you can use the Twitter hashtag hashtag climate tracker to ask any questions and to kind of keep in touch with us and we're going to go to some of the questions that are already on the Facebook page pretty soon but I, I wanted to kind of ask and, and this might take some brain power um, but negotiators love to be creative um, they love to kind of throw in a few metaphors throw in a few kind of turns of phrases that are uh, that might uh, excite other people um, do you have some favorite metaphors over the years that you can remember from other negotiators that just kind of just were so funny or so ridiculous that it like it stuck with you? Um, I, I think so. I, there, there, were, there were loads of metaphors out there, sometimes too much. I, re I remember when we were 
um, was it? Uh, I think we were in Bonn at the same time that the World Cup was happening. Um, in uh, was that in South Africa? Yeah. Um, and uh, everybody used football metaphor at that time, like uh, moving the goalposts or um, uh, awarding a red card to. Uh, you can call them a lot of, a lot of, uh, of uh, interesting, fascinating metaphors that developed uh, throughout the years. Um, there was one. Uh, there was one colleague who used uh, a, a a metaphor about the Kyoto Protocol, uh, and when the, the um, and when the when the accounting rules were being uh, were being um, discussed, then uh, and whether whether parties were wanted the rules first before they would even say they would. Uh, I would commit to one call it said, you know, metaphor. Um, what would you do to the grass if the horse is dead? So um, it, it's uh, in a way uh, alluding to uh, the Kyoto Protocol. What would you do with it uh, if uh, if uh, uh, if the rules uh, come out as uh, as uh, being uh, contrary to the interest of uh, preserving the rules-based regime? Uh, Another another metaphor of, uh, in this topic was uh, um, um, when um, when uh, I think it was uh, a reference to um, Shakespeare's uh, to KP or not to KP that is the question. <laughs> but uh, oh, there 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 are lots of metaphors. I can't remember some of it now, but uh, uh, it's. Uh, been, it's been a fantastic uh, expression throughout the years. Yeah, well, it's it's certainly been a, a linguistic journey um, as well as a uh, a political one. Um, so, thanks for sharing some of those memories. I forgot the KP or not to KP, but that's that's definitely right up there. Um, I guess kind of then moving forward, you, uh, you've recently stepped out of the UNFCCC um, and, and you've kind of, uh, I guess we can kind of get into some of the dynamics going on a, a little bit uh, later on. But right now you've decided to step out and, uh, and that's kind of obviously a decision that a lot of people were disappointed with and, and, and other people are kind of potentially really excited about what you're doing. Um, could you kind of explain how you feel right now in terms of how you're able to affect the climate movement and how someone stepping out of the negotiations perhaps can do even more to take them forward? Yeah, Chris, uh, I, I, think you, I, I think you're... Hello? Hello? Yeah, you there? Sorry? Yeah, you still you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you were you, you were breaking up a little bit, but uh, I your question was uh, how do I feel now uh, with the uh, options of NFTC and the kind in the uh, in the world that I know, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, uh, first, first thing I did all of my suits, my nice. <laughs> it's taking up a lot of space. Well, it's, um, in, in my luggage, so my luggage is not light with, with my walking clothes. Uh, now that uh, I'm doing this uh, special journey um, with people on the ground and uh, showcase uh, their resilience and uh, their defiance against this this whole climate uh, crisis and um there's they call this a larger fight i i was all uh, down from the corridors of power if you may and uh um and uh, yeah get rid of uh, get rid of the suit um to join the large fight against climate change because there is a large fight out there um how are you chris if, if you don't mind, if you don't mind the, the whole word knowing, but uh, <laughs> I think we've been negotiating, negotiating climate change uh, longer than you have been alive. So 
um, it, it's uh, it's something that we about um, and um, it, it's been too long now. I don't think we have uh, the kind of uh, urgency, the sense of urgency that's necessary to address this problem. I'm starting to believe or sort of uh, and starting to um, fall into the that um, maybe just maybe um, the kind of uh, process we have in trying to come up with an agreement uh, is a process that not result in an agreement that would have worked the climate right. And so the larger fight is for us to connect with regional communities who have a stake, a biggest stake in all this, um, with organizations, young people, especially around the world, um, churches, universities, and that's when we start uh, to uh, to make a difference. And uh, I think we've been given a gift. It's called the internet, and that's, that allows us to connect so easily the way we're we're talking each other now. And um, those who are responsible for the climate crisis are connected. That uh, we can turn the time, and um, and we can uh, they can test sense that we, and in a few days um, the Pope will join us uh, with an important message uh, on, on the environment and, uh, and and care for each other and care for creation. It's just uh, it's going to be uh, an amazing, amazing time for all of us. Uh, uh, and the, the key there is to realize that we, if we stand together and stand connected, um, uh, there is a lot of things, in fact, bigger things we can do outside of the formal negotiation process as we prove to them that the real power resides in the hands of the people and not uh, and not merely um, in, in those uh, shiny plenary homes. Hmm. Definitely. It, uh, I definitely feel the, the need to kind of balance uh, the negotiations and kind of the, the broader fight and uh, and I'm really glad uh, while I, I do admit I do miss your kind of antics here in the negotiations I am kind of glad to see you spreading your wings on the outside now and 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 it was interesting what you were saying about the your kind of move and movement now and and especially your connections with with the Pope soon um, we actually have some questions that I might like to turn to now and, and one is from uh, Tariq al Olamir and uh, also Monia Matus would follow it up and and he asked in the build up to the multi-faith climate convergence taking place in Rome later this month what role do you see uh, such uh, that the faith community network taking what what role do you think that the faith community network can play uh, in building the broader climate move climate movement throughout the rest of the year yeah, the faith community uh, has a very special role to play, but I would uh, I would stress uh, that the faith community is not homogenous. It's a very diverse community, uh, and that, that is its strength. The diversity of the interfaith community uh, is its strength. Why? Because it's a beautiful paradox. Of many, I, I, I'd say with all candidness, that many of us were brought up to hate others from other faiths, um, and. Uh, that's why it's a beautiful paradox that we are standing together on this issue and uh, thinking of arms and putting each other's arms uh, and to um, stand up against climate change. And um, that is that is the role of uh, faith communities uh, to make people realize that we're one human family. Um, but but, but that, that's all. That that might sound uh, uh, like a cliche, but. Uh, the, the truth is uh, what's missing in this whole discussion, um, the moral aspect of the issue. Climate change is not just an environmental issue, in fact, the biggest moral um, crisis of our time. And uh, the best way that we can address a moral crisis is to look deeply into ourselves and, uh, and, and, and uh, look at the, the way we treat each other um, and uh, look at the way we treat, treat uh, the very source of our life, uh, which is uh, which is the earth. Yeah, definitely, and and I guess kind of some of those notions would would definitely be tied up in the idea of climate justice, um, which is also something that a lot of people are, are interested in and and wanted to ask you some questions about. 
Um, and, and I guess kind of building on from those, uh, the way we treat each other as people and, and kind of to broader questions of the way countries treat each other. Um, we have a question that asks, what do you think climate justice looks like to you? Um, and we have another kind of question that is on the same lines of, of how can we make the words agreed upon become a reality in, quest in, in countries that are based on fossil fuel extraction? And, and what do you feel that the climate justice uh, movement has to play in, in these kind of challenges that we all face now? Well, first, uh, on the first part of that question, we, we, we need to address climate change by uh, a massive global transformation. I'm talking about the systems that we built, about the values uh, that, that we that we embrace, we're, we're going to have to change many of much of that. I mean, the whole world at the same, maybe at the at the scale that's bigger than the first industrial revolution. So it's a it's a massive undertaking, and uh, it's it's something that's starting to happen, but we. Uh, need to push it uh, so that it uh, it uh, really materializes. Otherwise, we're not going to solve climate change. More people will become poor, and then uh, our societies will just degenerate. Uh, um, um, we're, we're we're not uh, able uh, we're not able to build societies for the future, and that's why it's an, it's an imperative. Um, and climate justice. This climate justice, uh, I think we learned that uh, early enough in life uh, what fairness means. Uh, maybe fairness means not taking uh, what's not yours, or fairness may mean uh, if you have uh, if you have two apples and you have a friend, you share one apple with your friend, but you have one each. Um, I don't know, yeah, each one of us have been taught this value of fairness um, since we were young, and uh, we've lost that, and climate Justice is able to uh, refuse um, to acknowledge the importance of fairness as uh, to hold them up to be able to acknowledge uh, the actions uh, that they have uh, committed in the past that has affected people um, in, in the present. So, um, this uh, aspect of this whole issue, we can never move forward if justice is not served and justice is. Uh, and, and climate justice, uh, in, in more specific terms, uh, is about um, those who benefited from the kind of industrialization that has occupied uh, the atmospheric space uh, must uh, must uh, be able to share these resources uh, and share um, share the um, the what what remains left. Yeah. And in order for us to all achieve our full human potential, it's about it's about really uh, dignity of for for everybody, uh, dignity for everybody's lives uh, all over the world. Definitely, and and just on that line, we have a question from Japan from uh, Yuki Ohashi, um, who I guess, and this is something that you've dealt with throughout your whole career, and, and definitely in that question. But what do you think that the responsibility of developed countries is for the disasters currently caused by climate change? So there was a question from Japan and it was all around what, is, what are the responsibilities of developed countries um, for all the disasters caused by climate change? And, uh, and this questionnaire actually also especially wanted to know um, your views on Japan in relation to this question. Yeah, first my views on Japan. Um, I, I think Japan uh, has not uh, proven that it can lead on the issue of climate change. I think it has uh, backtracked uh, tremendously in, in, in recent times, and uh, we expect more from from Japan on on, the, on this very important issue. Um, on on who's responsible? I don't think it's uh, a matter of finger pointing and. and Blaming who was responsible for this. Um, it's, it's up to the countries. It is very clear. It's up to the, these countries to acknowledge that responsibility. And I think in climate convention, 
it's also very clear that the, uh, the notion of historical responsibility is enshrined in the convention. Um, um, but if you ask me how we allocate responsibility and distribute it fairly, health development, right? It's about, again, dignity of people's lives. Uh, if you have attained a certain level of dignity or if you may translate that into a certain level of welfare, um, then you, you have a responsibility to care for other people around the world. And for those who are struggling to reach, you, you, you got to give them a lending hand and you got to, uh, you got to help welfare and responsibility means uh, those who are enjoying the kind of uh, um, economic growth uh, that has happened uh, in, uh, in in the last 100, 150 uh, they must they must recognize that they have benefited from that and uh, so and, and that means they are responsible especially if uh, they have uh, they have benefited in a way that, uh, that that it is disproportionate uh, in terms of benefit, especially if they've been over-consuming uh, and uh, living living lives equivalent to what twenty Filipinos, uh, Nigerians. It's uh, it's a uh, very unfair. Uh, it's a very unfair world out there, and uh, our responsibility is to correct that unfair. Um, I think I think humanity has the ability to correct the mistakes of history if we have proven so many times, and this is one opportunity to do so. Yeah, definitely. And I guess you you just commented on the the Japanese government, and and this week we saw that the G7 came out with a very strong statement um, around climate change, around decarbonization. Do you think that is uh, that type of statement is starting to get towards the type of responsibility you would like to see developed countries take? Um, you were breaking up again. Part of that question, sorry, Chris. No worries. Uh, the question was around the G7. Um, so the G7 came out obviously very strong this week. Um, in in some people have have kind of interpreted it as a call to the for the end of fossil fuels. Um, before the end of the century. Do you think this type of, uh, I guess, statement, this type of agreement is, is the type of responsibility that developed countries have to take or, or do they need to go even further? Uh, I think rhetoric um, is something we can't afford today. Um, if we will end um, the use of fossil fuels at the end of the century enough. I, I, I think we, can, we cannot afford the, to uh, to see such uh, such procrastination in this in this in this whole issue. And uh, the most vulnerable people around the world uh, cannot accept this kind of this kind of problems when. Um, we know very well that resources are available, the technology is available. Um, it's just something that's uh, hard to find and make it renewable. We uh, we know that it is possible in the we in our self um, and effort to the importantly is uh, being away from a, from a particular energy source, but also. Um, um, transforming the system. It's not just energy, it's not just transport, it's not just the way we take care of our, our, our use our forests. It's also the way we, we have a regional system that programs everyone that you need to show more and um, and uh, and uh, be part of a, of a of a wasteful society. We, we have a lot out of the uh, of them. Uh, and uh, we're all about, uh, but very lacking in uh, in concrete uh, action that uh, we to be in the near future. Again, the whole the whole um, process is right there having in mind. Uh, you're, you're, we're really um, really uh, traveling around and put there. Um, uh, really, it's 
really this concern is that many many people are have forgotten about pre twenty twenty ambition. Yeah, I definitely agree, and and it it doesn't seem like the G seven is is kind of even discussing pre twenty twenty ambition at the moment, and and that's the I guess the key thing for the, obviously the next five years, um, and. And I guess there's some other questions, you know, uh, you've got a lot of experience in the climate negotiations and, and there's a lot of people who are wondering, you know, what do you think uh, we can really achieve out of Paris at the end of this year? Paris, um, no, your, your, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> um, it's, uh, uh, but let's, let's, let's accept Let's just dissect the whole thing right now. Um, how many pages do we have there in urban platform for the AD, um, for, for the Paris text? Uh, a good 100 pages, maybe? Ah, you're a little bit out of date. We're, I think we're down to something just below 80 right now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but we're expecting a, a streamlined text um, coming out quite soon. Uh, a non-paper, as you might remember, for all those watching on. Uh, there's a there's a lot of different kind of types of documents that negotiators play with while they are uh, trying to kind of come together on agreements and and a non paper is one of the fun ways that they get to uh, talk about different kind of decisions without actually being able to have to make or commit to anything and that's what they look like they might be playing with for the next couple of months um, before Paris but uh but you're right we're still looking at a very very big document um, where obviously some of the key political issues that you uh, were so forceful on and, and so kind of uh, straightforward about uh, are still obviously uh, very much undiscussed at the moment. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so, so it's still a complicated situation. Um, I'd say you have 10 negotiating days left until Paris. Um, in, in my experience, uh, 10 days is just uh, something uh, out of uh, what is still very uncertain at this uh, as of this point. So, uh, but but uh, that should that should not uh, deter us from uh, raising our hopes. Um, it's it's still ten days uh, of negotiating time left at the end because sometimes it doesn't matter where, whether you have ten days or two hours. Um, many of the things get decided in the last minute anyway. But. Um, um, you see how uh, you can predict Paris by the by by the things that countries say they will do for this process, and uh, the divergence is huge. Um, the and then when I when I mean Paris, I will gauge that um, by the way that that agreement will both uh, fulfill the scientific imperative and also the equity imperative, um, which is fairness. And uh, I think you know, if, if I don't think there is enough time uh, just really to forge a, an agreement that will fulfill both the, the scientific imperative and the scientists. It is, uh, and that, that is just uh, that is just my humble uh, uh, opinion on how it can turn out and uh, what we see can be a political dec declaration, which we do need. Um, because uh, we cannot afford uh, Paris from 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 failing uh, and failing the whole world. So we even come out of Paris, but whether that uh, is uh, ambitious enough, sufficient, adequate, and fair, uh, we will we will all be judged uh, uh, on December twelfth. Yeah, definitely, and and I think that's a really good perspective to have. Um, and one possibly it's it's much easier for you to have now that you're kind of outside of the negotiations and and kind of connecting with people on the grassroots a lot more and and I'm just kind of I wanted if to ask a question that was posed by by Risalat Khan from Bangladesh um, and and he asked the he noted that the people's climate march injected a lot of momentum into the climate movement and and perhaps even some momentum into the climate negotiations and, uh, and he notes that there's going to be a lot of uh, mobilizations planned for Paris and cities around the world leading up to November 29th. 
Uh, but he asked, in, in countries where climate movements are not as active um, and when it's hard to get people into the streets, what strategies and approaches do you think can be most powerful in shifting the politics? Um, and, and this is obviously especially kind of poignant for you now that you are trying to build a, a, a bit of a global movement, especially inspiring faith-based organizations. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, it's uh, important for us to and, uh, that realize that we are uh, one connected global movement. I know we, we are very diverse in terms, even in terms of views, even in terms of appreciation of the problem and in what uh, we think on the ground. But uh, we need to understand that this is, a, uh, this is a family we're building, that we are all connected and we can't do this um, separate, uh, separately. We need to stand together. And if you are living in a country where climate change is not taken seriously, then that's that's their role uh, to make politicians, church leaders, uh, industry leaders uh, realize that uh, this is a serious uh, issue uh, that many people care about. And um, it, it, there are varying degrees of engagement in every country. Um, but what I'd say is that climate change is not the problem. Climate change is a symptom of many of the this happening in each and every country. So don't be scared and go against um, exploitation, don't be scared to stand up against um, especially opaque transactions, uh, uh, the setting up of, um, of a dirty energy power plants or, or even extractive industries that, um, that are that serve the best interests of, uh, of people. Uh, these, these are these are things we, we must all work together uh, to correct. This, this is an age of uh, of change. It's a great time to be alive. Uh, we must be proud to be part of this generation. This generation will be the one that will um, that will stop this problem um, because we have no option to. To, to hand it down, to hand down this problem to the next generation. So, um, in your countries, uh, you, you must build those movements. And um, if you may, uh, and uh, we'll be honored if you can be part of this people's pilgrimage. The people's pilgrimage is a special journey for all of us, and we won't uh, embarking on this journey until until we see a world that's ready ready to move on. Uh, towards a brighter, uh, a better future. It's, uh, it's about organizing your own journeys in your own countries and linking it up with a platform called the People's Pilgrimage.org. You can click on the map and add your own journey there, and uh, that will allow all of us to be connected. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've checked out the map and I've uh, been trying to see what routes I can take and everything like that. So I'll definitely be having a look at and seeing how I can participate. And, and I recommend everyone else participate as well. It's, it's a brilliant initiative and, and, and it's a way that we can all kind of contribute going forward to Paris um, and, and trying to make Paris a moment where, like you say, leaders uh, agree to something that's based in fairness and not based in a kind of vague political decision that that suits their interests for now and, and maybe they'll try and do something about it later when when their interests change or something like that. But but I guess outside of this pilgrimage, there's a lot of questions on on what can young people do to kind of affect this process. And and that's something that I've been trying to do for a while, but I'm I'm definitely not an expert in that. Um, and but it's definitely something that you probably have a few opinions on and and so from those people who, who maybe don't get to travel to Paris or or even those people that do, what do you think are the best ways that people can try and affect the UNFCCC process? Um, I've always been stumped by that question, Chris, because uh, there's just so many ways of uh, being involved. Um, but uh, the young people of today is, has a gift, and I mentioned that earlier, is called the internet. Um, imagine when I was, uh, when I was in college, uh, we didn't even have cell phones, we didn't have email even. So today it's easy to connect with people uh, and stay connected. And uh, that is powerful because if you have like minded people all over the world uh, who care about the same stuff uh, and, 
and then in this issue together uh, and uh, that is something that young people need to be connected with people in other communities in other countries because that gives you a sense of solidarity and that sense of solidarity is powerful um mm -hmm. and also don't understand and don't underestimate the power of uh, positive energy it's, uh, it's something that I've, I've proven works very effectively um uh instead of uh treat looking at this issue with a lot of fear with a lot of resentment and treat the climate issue with a lot of love uh, because uh, if, if we look at uh, what we can do in terms of solutions, uh, it's small and big. Uh, those little things you can do every day, like uh, what you do at home, or, or big things by doing things together. Like this kid who's uh, uh, gone to crowdfunding and uh, raised enough money to clean up uh, the oceans uh, from plastic. And that's something that comes from a dream and a dream that's pursued. Uh, into reality so don't be afraid to try these things but do it out of love and not out of fear and not out of anger uh, because uh, a lot of young people tend to uh, be angry with people who, who, who commit uh, who are responsible for the injustice but uh, do it out of love for, for others and uh, uh, and for especially love for those uh, who, are, who are so uh, to, be be blessed with a uh, uh, walking on this earth in the future. Yeah, it's uh, that's that's quite something to say. You know, it, it's it's I guess especially as as someone from Australia, it's it's very hard to I guess uh, look on to some of the political decisions that that are made uh, in my country and that are made in many other countries and and kind of treat it with love. Uh, do you have any advice for people who who might look on to what their country is doing and, and just kind of naturally like levitate towards kind of disgust and, and how they can kind of use that energy in a more positive way? Um, I, 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 sorry, you were breaking up question, Chris. So I was just saying that, that what you were saying was, was quite profound and and might be very difficult for some people to kind of take in um, if, if they're living in countries that they, they don't agree with what they're doing, you know, whether they're, uh, they're trying to protest the, the Sundarbans coal plant proposals in, in Bangladesh or whether they're trying to protest the Galilee Basin mines in, in, in Queensland, in Australia, or, or, you know, the proposed coal plants that are, that are proposed for the Philippines as well. You know, when, when young people are kind of shown these examples of, of what their government is doing, um, it, it's much easier to obviously be kind of disgusted and, and be angered by it. Um, but, but you're here saying that they should treat it with love. And I was just wondering if you have any advice for how young people can use, uh, you know, that, that energy to and kind of direct it in a positive way. Yeah. Th thank you, Chris. Uh, um yeah i mean doing things out of love does not mean that you let people who are responsible off the hook um in, in the world's uh, religious traditions uh, many of our spiritual figures uh manifested manifested fierceness manifested um their in fact their righteous anger uh in and and for me they manifested it in a very positive way so I think uh, we need to follow those examples uh, and uh, manifest our righteous anger. Uh, we allow us to pursue positive means um, to change things. And um, I'm talking about the legitimacy of civil disobedience when it is the legitimacy of blockades, of, of uh, standing together, meeting up arms. I'm talking about the legitimacy of the divestment um, campaign uh, and uh, the legitimacy of uh, speaking out and uh, pointing, pointing, uh, and naming names uh, if we have to uh, in, in the context of uh, holding those accountable to the most profit, uh, profit from the suffering of others. That is that is something of a part of our moral responsibility. So I'm not saying that. Uh, uh we, we 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 stay silent and uh um and, and uh, let 
that's uh, and I'm saying that uh, to be able to truly let others live is, is that uh, we fight up for them. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. It it sounds uh it sounds a lot like something uh, someone called Cornell West might agree with, um, and it sounds like a lot like something that that maybe some others in the uh, I guess more kind of uh, I, in the in the climate movement in general might agree with. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, it's been really amazing to talk to you, and uh, and I've been doing my best to try and bring in some questions from from this kind of captive audience that we have. But, uh, but I definitely haven't been able to answer everyone's questions and, uh, and I definitely haven't been able to kind of address all of the diverse uh, ideas and questions people wanted to ask you. And, and, uh, and I'll be kind of jumping on Twitter after this um, on hashtag climate tracker to try and, uh, try and connect you with some of those young people. But there's also the Facebook page, which I'd love to invite you to kind of to go on and, and to try and connect with some young people who We've asked questions that maybe we haven't been able to answer tonight, um, but but it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I'm uh, I'm so kind of um, I guess proud as as a as a friend, as a kind of as someone who's who's tried to kind of support the uh, the ideas that you've developed over the years. Um, I'm I'm really amazed at, at at the work that you're doing now and the transition you've made, and uh, and thank you so much for trying to connect with us and connecting with the young people who are watching. Uh, the honor is mine, Chris. The honor and pleasure is mine, and uh, uh, I, might, I may be older than than you and many of the young people. Out there. You got a lot of wisdom, and I learn a lot from you. Uh, the I learn a lot about the human spirit from people like you, and uh, thank you for that. Well, <sighs> that's uh, that's lovely. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching. This is uh, this has been a. A pretty amazing discussion from myself and and like I said we'll be trying to answer all your questions online we're uh, we're closing down the SB 42 the negotiations here in Bonn and and obviously we're now going to try and transition to the road to Paris um, or, or the people's the people's pilgrimage which is uh, what uh, what Yeb will be focusing on as well so thank you so much and and I encourage you all to kind of engage with the uh, adopt the negotiator program keep engaged with the people's pilgrimage and and all the other mobilizations going on around the world there was a lot of questions around how to kind of mobilize people back at home in, in a whole kind of range of countries and contexts whether it was faith based environments whether it was kind of uh, dangerous or, or environments where people haven't kind of got a tradition of protest and and I hope that this has helped you all better understand uh, how you might engage in those contexts and and I hope this is something that has inspired you to, to keep moving towards Paris and, and keep active for the rest of the year. Thank you so much for watching and, and thank you again, Yo. Thank you, Chris.